Woohoo! All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Hello, everybody. And what am I afraid to do? Oh, start recording. That's a good thing. Let's see. Bonus recording here. Uh, let me post a YouTube link. Da -da -da. There we go. So, what we're going to discuss today, we're going to continue along our sort of shmup path, our shoot 'em up project path, and talk about a bunch of techniques that will help with that specifically. Um, and also, getting a little bit more organized, a little bit more, um, I'm going to introduce a, a little bit more in terms of some data structures that are going to help you out in your games and projects and so on. And uh, hopefully just uh, have lots of fun and mayhem today. Why not? Right? I I'm, I'm, don't have uh, grades for the projects yet. You got to let me kind of catch up on that. Um, but we'll, we'll get there too. So, so far from what I've seen, things are pretty reasonable. Um, but we'll get there. All right, so let me let me find a let me find a slide or two here. Uh, we can uh, change to and all right. So here's what I want to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things, and not necessarily in this order. We're actually definitely not going to. to uh, show them in exactly this order, but why not? We'll just uh, we'll put them in the, in the, they're already in the slide title. Serialized field, scriptable objects, delegates, events, and input axes. So a bunch of sort of, uh, let's see, serialized field and scriptable objects, they're sort of related. Delegates and events, yep, they're sort of related. And then of course we have input axes, which are just another really important fun thing to have. And going to be really important, specifically with regards to our shoot 'em up games, because there's going to be now we want a, a different type of input, a different type of input. We're not just going to be moving uh, necessarily with the mouse left and right like we did with the Apple Picker. Instead, we want to have probably one of two potential ways of moving the player. There is uh, sort of the WASD technique you know, with the uh, up, down, left, right, or forward, backward, left, and right sort of motion. And the other one is sort of a tank style motion, right? So you sort of uh, turn left and right and move forward and back, as opposed to always moving, always translating up, down, left, and right. But we're actually going to use the input axis or the input get axis in either of those cases, right? And the cool thing, now input axis is a built-in kind of predefined set of virtual joystick axis, axes that uh, Unity has. There is a new version or a new input system that Unity has now implemented um, that uh, is uh, arguably certainly, well, it's, it's more powerful, more configurable, more elaborate. Um, but it's also quite a bit more to kind of set up. So I still like to use, and it's still supported, the old input the, or the normal, the mid-range input system is still there. So we like to start with that because it does introduce most of the concepts and gets you kind of up and running a bit faster. Um, and let's see, I think what I'm gonna do, let's see if I can do this. Um, why isn't that, oh, that's over there, let me, let me do this just because, whoops, not lap scene. Uh, here we go. I'm going to, just because in the interest of saying hello and my face being here, make it a little bit more personal. So you can kind of see me talking and, and acting weird in the midst of all this, this sea of, you know, of text here. So you can see how shocked I am or, or whatever by the, some of these things. Maybe I'll turn it off in a minute. Who knows? Um, so anyway, Unity has this 
predefined set of virtual joystick axes. And the cool thing is, so now you don't have to worry about, you know, specifically like if you wanted to implement WASD keys, W-A-S-D, to how to have input motion, but you also had, and one of the reasons I wanted to put the camera on is because I have some, nope, well, I have them over in another part of the room. Um, Joy-Con, joy, you know, joystick controller sort of thing. Uh, I'm sure you have all played uh, one game or another uh, using a console kind of joystick, uh, Joy-Con, whether it be dual stick or, you know, whatever you have dealt with, you know, you, you've used other types of input systems. And the nice thing is that if you use something like the Unity input system, you kind of get that for free. It's kind of built in. You can get the keyboard interaction, you get the mouse, you can, you know, all these sort of things. And it's, you can kind of uh, overlay those on top of one another without necessarily saying, okay, let me key, let me hard code every, each and every key press, every, you know, every key code. Uh, is it the joystick? Is it this, that, the other thing? Unity kind of sets that up for you, right? And it also even does things like it has uh, smoothing and spring back. So you can have like, you know, analog sticks that are sort of springy and, and you can even have the, uh, the keyboard when it's doing its kind of WASD emulation of a joystick, it will kind of act as if it was um, an analog stick. So it kind of, you know, has, has some spring back and smoothing. Or you can also use raw discrete values using input.getAxis raw. And that lets you just get like the instant, you know, kind of, is it left, is it right? You know, there's no kind of analog bits in between. So this is really cool. And you can use these sort of things to, uh, we're gonna use them to directly manipulate things like position and animator states and so on, right? So that's what basically is gonna be going on as the user interacts with their player. You're gonna like trigger animation states. You're gonna move the player around the screen. So let's, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and what the heck, I'll, I'll turn off my little window there, but I'm gonna switch over just to kind of show you inside Unity what I'm talking about. So here's Unity, here's 20, uh, 2020 where we kind of left off last time. We had our little character here and um, the character wasn't doing much of anything but we were kind of directly manipulating some things. Oh, well, we had that, that kind of interpolated slide. We're gonna get that out of there. Uh, let's get that interpolated slide out of there. Uh, so here we are in the hierarchy and we have a little mega character here and we had this move to script. So move to here. Um, and well, let's find, actually, I think there was another one mega move. I think was, let's see, let's find the scene, another scene that maybe we had movement in. Uh, where is the one where we had animation in it? I think this is the one. All right. So it's sitting there doing its thing. And if we don't maximize on play and we showed this mega character, yes, it had the animator going on here. So we were able to do things like, and we'll disable Snow Kid. We don't want to see Snow Kid. So we have the Mega Man character or Mega, whoever the character is. And uh, we'll hit play. And if, uh, is it, uh, how did I do it? Uh, I was manipulating, oh, not Snow Kid, that one. I was taking the rigid body and we were running or going left depending on the movement. And let's, well, let's look at the script before I try to like all just reverse engineer it straight from here. Let's look at our mega move script. Oh, there it was, there's our speed. All right, I think that was, so let's uh, change the speed here, all right? So if I change the speed, I could walk in one direction or change the other speed, go in the other direction kind of thing. That was a really brute force way of moving the character around here. And it doesn't exactly move perfectly anyway. But we want to move the character using the input axes. All right, so let's open up our mega move, um, our mega move script here. Let me get on 
the other screen. And we want to use the input system. Now, generally, you're going to want to use the input system. You're going to pull for, you're going to query for input in the update routine. So as often as you can, you know, it's going to be nice and responsive because it's based on, um, you know, you, basically the user is not going to be able to tell if they're being responded to at anything faster than the frame rate anyway. So you might as well have, you know, generally we kind of keep input in the update routine. So let's, let's put it in the update routine <clears throat> for now. So we're going to say if, and the question is what, if what? Now, inside the project, if we go to, whoops, not in that project, but whoops. Oh, come on, Unity. In our Unity project, if we go to project settings, you'll notice, oh, by default, here we are in the, in the uh, input manager, right? And boy, am I repeating myself? Do we already cover this? Am I like, am I forgetting? Okay, all right, boy, I'm just totally freaking out now. I've been locked away here in my, my room for too long. And sometimes what happens is I like, answer a question for game dev one students who are like trying to do a specific thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, wait, I just looked at that screen. Sorry about that. All right, get back on, get my, back, my brain back here. All right, so we have the input manager. There it is, project settings, input manager. So talk about easy. And we have these things called axes that's gonna be mapped to certain physical controllers and it's going to provide these sort of virtual axes that we can use to kind of detect what's going on. So two of the main ones that we look at are horizontal. And if we look, we'll see here, ah, okay, there's uh, buttons, negative button left, positive button right, neg alternate negative button, A, alternate positive button, D. And we might even have the x-axis on a joystick, right? So it allows us to kind of provide a couple of different ways to get input and have it mapped to this axis, this axis called horizontal. Um, you'll notice that there may be, you know, in this case, there's like an extra version. So we have now, you know, something to do, you know, specifically uh, if we connect a different joystick and things, we might have multiple joysticks, but let's just look at the first one. So this is using a key or mouse button and the other one, is, uh, I think that was, the other one was the one that is specifically a joystick axis, right? So this is gonna handle our Joy-Con. This up here is emulating a Joy-Con, you know, through this sort of thing. But anyway, so that's what this axis is. So we have a horizontal and we have a vertical, right? So vertical is down, up, and also S and W. And it also has things like a gravity setting, a dead zone, sort of sensitivity and snap. So it can also cover things like analog sticks and also kind of give us a, a little bit of a feel for um, the actual, um, you know, the, the analog stick kind of not just immediately returning to center and so on. And it allows you to kind of debounce and kind of smooth the interaction of, of kind of what's going on. Now you'll notice we also do have mouse X and mouse Y. So there is an axis for mouse movement as well. So if we want to use the, you know, be consistent and use the mouse input as part of the input system, we can do that as well. So we'll do that as a more advanced example. And, you know, maybe we're using WASD for movement and then we're using the mouse to actually aim. So we have mouse look and, you know, kind of, so kind of dual stick control if we want it as well. So that's where the input manager lives. Chances are you're probably not going to need to really kind of deal with this too much, right? Once it's kind of set up, set up to reasonable values and so on, we can just kind of use it as is. You know, maybe you want to get fancy and change the gravity or the dead zone or sensitivity or something. But for now, let's just leave it as it is. You just kind of take it for granted. So here we have our character. And now let's try to go and use that. So we'll say um, input dot, and we would say get axis, and we'll say we're going to name the axis. So horizontal, the axis we want to get. So that. 
So at this point, you cannot implicitly convert type float to bool, right? Because we can't say if this, we'd have to say if this is greater than, or we'll actually go ahead and get rid of the if entirely. Should have done that. So this is our horizontal axis. And we'll go ahead and we'll have our vertical axis. And these are just going to return a floating point number that says, you know, between negative one and one, indicating sort of like which direction you're going in. So, for example, the horizontal, if I press A, it's going to become negative one. If I press D, it's going to become positive one. And for a moment, it'll be in between. Or it might be zero if neither of them are pressed. So let's, let's do this. Let's say, um, or just for the heck of it, so it doesn't say it all the time, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to have a function called private void yeah, show axes. Right? And I'm going to print out these values, right? Print h. Plus, and put v. So there we go. It's going to print h plus v and show us what the two axes are. And I'm going to go ahead in the start routine. I'm going to say invoke repeating. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show axes. This is really just for me. And I'm going to say um, start at 0. And then print that only every, so zero seconds. And just so I don't have it go all the crazy all over the place, I'm going to have show it only every one second. All right? So it's going to print this over and over and over again every second. So here we go. We'll refresh things. We'll hit play. And we'll go to the console, and you'll see every second it's saying 0, 0. Now I'm going to press the D key. Oh, I'm going to go to the game, activate the game there. And now, whoops, if I see down here, I probably, it's gone. this warning about. Something happened that's uh, not quite right. You can't cancel if there is no cancellation callback registered. Fail to load. Mm, that's weird. Let's clear that again. OK, now you can see horizontal was 1, press 0. It momentarily was on its way back to 0. And now it's negative 1. And now v is 1, v is 0, and v is negative 1. OK. So maybe I could have gone even faster. I mean, that's, that's a pretty slow update rate, but that's good enough to see what's going on. right? So I can have a little debug routine going on there in the background, just, just so I know what's going on. So that's useful. Let's go back over here. And I'm going to make that just say 0.5 seconds here. But for now, I'm going to disable that. So here, in my update routine, I had input.getAxis horizontal, input.axis vertical. Now, if you recall, I was setting the velocity of the rigid body of the game object that we're on, which is our little Mega Man style character. And we're setting the velocity to speed 
And let's see, let's change it to speed here as well. Okay. Now speed is set to zero, but let's set speed to something like three meters per second. All right. Now, if I just save and play, anyone want to predict what's going to happen? So you know, flying what direction though? Up and to the right, up and to the right. So, or not. So let's see, why is it, why is our character not moving? So here, Mega Man, uh, speed somehow, because, now this happens quite often. If I have modified this at all here, if I've modified this, this one is gonna take precedent over the one that I set in my code. And that's something to remember for, uh, as we get into serialized fields and scriptable objects. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and set that to four and he just went flying off in that direction. Negative one, negative, I'm gonna get him, try to get him back here. Negative four, here he comes flying back in the other direction. All right, so I can, obviously controlling it via changing that number is kind of painful and not, not great, but we'll set it to say three meters per second there. So I know that's the speed I wanted to control it at, but I want to control it really by the movement of the joystick. So if we go over to our, uh, our code here, and what we really want to do is say, all right, this is returning a float from negative one to positive one in the horizontal. So we're going to take that and multiply that by speed. Okay. And we're going to take the vertical and multiply that here. So now we're going to be directly setting the speed of the rigid body according to that axis times speed. So the maximum speed is going to be whatever we set. And it's probably set over in the, uh, it is set over in the Unity interface. But it's going to be controlled by whether or not the joystick is pointing in that direction. All right. So we're going to come here. And it's set to three, so three meters per second. When I press play, it's not going to move at all, though, because my joystick is at zero, zero. Now, it's, it's going to play the idle animation, but other than that, it's just kind of sitting there. But now, watch. All right, so I'm pressing the key. Something's kind of out of whack with regards to the animations. So let's not worry about it. We'll have to fix those later. Um, <laughs> definitely, uh, something wacky going on. So let's, let's turn off the animator for a moment and strictly worry about the motion here. All right. So we're sliding left and right according to the A and D key, right? And if I press the S key or the W key, we're moving up and down, right? And you'll notice it does kind of accelerate and decelerate, right? Kind of zoom, you know, we kind of smooth into those. Even though we didn't set any smoothing, we didn't use interpolating, we didn't use anything like that. The reason that is is because it is sort of faking this to be a little bit of a joystick, right? You'll notice, remember before in the console window, it didn't just go zero to one, it had some in-between values, right? So the moment I let go, it actually built in a little bit of deceleration. And that's because I'm not using the raw values, I'm using the, um, the non sort of non raw value there. Let's see, um, and let's uh, let's kind of contrast what that would be like. So here we are. This is using get axis, right? Now let's be let's let's do something kind of fancy. We're gonna say if input dot get key get key down. Well, let's just say uh, get returns true during the frame the user starts pressing the key. Let's just say get key. We want it to be just all the time. Get key returns true while the user holds down the key identified. And we're going to say key code 
dot uh, left shift. All right. So this is fancy. It's, I'm going to say, all right, if the if the player is holding down the shift key, we're going to use that version. Else, and this is just just to demonstrate. I'm going to copy this code here and get rid of those extra bits there and get access raw. And what the heck, I'm even going to do it up here. Oops. Else. And that should have space there, too. Um, and get access raw. So if I'm holding the shift key down, I get the smooth version. If I'm not holding the shift key down, I'm going to get the raw version. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on invoke repeating. So this is how it looks. It's not. Oh, and I'm going to do this. I was going to remember to turn this off while I'm in not in while I'm not in play mode. Otherwise, it's going to reset it, and so I should have. So here we go. All right. So this is the normal, the, the smooth version, or the non-smooth. This is I'm holding the left key, the shift key down, and you'll see I'm getting these in-between values. So it has a kind of a nice smooth feel to it. If I'm not, I just get either negative one or positive one or zero. All right. So if I move versus if I held the shift key down, right? Because it has some acceleration and deceleration built, built in there. So that's the, oops. No, it's not slow. It's it basically, if you think about it, pressing a key on the keyboard is either, it's, it's a binary event. It's I'm either pressing it or I'm not pressing it, right? Um, there's no, I can't, kind of hold the key down halfway. There's no halfway. I'm either pressing it or not pressing it. So the horizontal axis, really, the raw value is going to be either I'm going in that direction or I'm not going in that direction. But what Unity will do for you is it'll provide you that this kind of built-in smoothed version, which is the one that's not, that's not called raw, right? So this version here, this get axis horizontal, get axis vertical, is subject to, uh, come on, project settings. Here, you'll see there is gravity and dead and sensitivity. It's going to use those. You'll see it kind of says, oh, OK, speed in units per second that the output value falls towards neutral when the device is at rest. Right, so the moment I stop playing it, it's actually going to use this to say, oh, okay, how quickly should I actually return to zero? Right. Except, exactly, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Well, it's, it, it's the feel of the game that you're going for, right? Um, if you have something like just a character like that, then you might want to use the raw, the, the non-raw version, right? So it's, it's a feel sort of thing. You should be aware of both of them. Um, if you want something that, you know, act really kind of very fast and twitchy, you use the raw version. If you have something where you want it to feel a little bit more smooth and, you know, physically grounded, you use the not raw version baked, the cooked, the smooth version, whatever, whatever you're going to call it. Okay. So it's up to your style. Those are the two of them. So be aware of those. Now, the most basic case, we're kind of demonstrating the, the, the most basic case here where we are using physics. We are using physics to move because we are using, we are modifying the 
or instantaneously really modifying the velocity of the rigid body, right? So we're not actually applying a force. In the real world, we'd be applying a force and we wouldn't be setting an instantaneous velocity for our object here. But, you know, this isn't the real world. So we can do it this way. We can say, okay, the rigid body's velocity is set to this value instantaneously, All right? That works, that lends itself pretty well to this, this sort of thing. Um, where it doesn't lend itself is as you get into like lots of complex physics interactions and things, and you don't want to just set the velocity. You want to have more of an interaction kind of going on. And that gets slightly trickier. And we'll, we'll start to look at that in the, in the next case I'm going to show you here. All right. So this is the most basic input case. Uh, and I would refer to this as sort of, you know, your typical WASD style character style motion. All right. Now, the other style I'm going to refer to more as sort of a, uh, uh, a vehicular style or rotational style of motion. And honestly, um, well, I'll, I'll show it with, the, with this character, and we'll, we'll see the, the shortcomings of this sort of thing. Uh, so let's go in and go back here. All right. So right now I'm setting that motion. I'm and I'm doing this according to that. All right. Now imagine instead, uh, like the asteroids case or the tank style case, where what I want to do is I want to rotate my object according to left and right. All right. So maybe I, I'm gonna let's tackle that first. All right. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna call this. Um, just to get it out of the way for a moment, we're going to call it WASD. And we'll have yet another version. We'll just leave it the normal names now. And, well, the axis, I guess, the axis isn't really going to change. This is just the value of the axes. So we don't really need a special version. There's no WASD involved here. It's always just the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. So we actually shouldn't even worry about those. So there they are, show axes. But we have the WASD version, and we're going to have another version. All right, so here will be the other version, whatever that is. So for starters, we'll say, and, and we'll, we're just going to use, I'm going to make this, let's assume we're going to, since this is a vehicle, sort of something vehicular, we'll just say, is I, I'm only going to use the smooth one from now. And I'm just going to disable my animator component for now. So instead of just manipulating the velocity like that, let's do this. Uh, I'm going to say, now I want horizontal. That's the one I'm really interested in, right? Horizontal is going to be not the normal velocity, but the angular velocity. Okay. And I think this always gets me. Let's see if I, if I get it right. So I'm going to say negative speed so that I'm moving clockwise, because normally our angle goes from 0 along the that axis and goes up. So here we're going to, I think I've got it right. So now horizontal is going to set the angular velocity of the character as opposed to the linear velocity. And we'll see what that means. Right. So we have our character. We're going to start. Start. And now. I did, I broke something. Well, hard. Oh, oh, it's just really slow. So I'm holding horizontal, I'm holding on the D key, and it is very slowly rotating in the direction I want it to, but very slowly. Right? Because that is in, I think that's set to something like degrees per second. Let's go double check here. Let's go. 
and angular velocity is in degrees per second. So we're moving at roughly, what, three degrees per second. So that's really darn slow. Right. So we'd want to crank this up. And I'm going to go so far as to say we should have now something called angular, or let's call it rotation speed. And we're going to say, in one second, we want to rotate 180 degrees. So halfway, halfway around. And here, rotation speed. All right. Hit play. Boy, Unity gets slower and slower to restart every release because it's just doing so much more stuff. All right, so now I'm rotating around my center. And you'll see it did take a, a slight moment to kind of slow down. Right. Now, for this type of character, this sort of system isn't really great, right? You rarely see an RPG style game or, I mean, this, this, this character isn't really great for, I don't think it was animated really, really well for the up down piece of it as well. But so this would be, imagine we had a car or a boat or a spaceship or an asteroid or something like that, where we're really looking down onto a rigid sort of vehicle that we wouldn't necessarily animate to provide left and right looking motion, right? We're really moving the orientation according to, you know, that. So, um, uh, well, we won't, we won't, I guess we won't worry about this. But now let's face, we're, we're faced with the, the, the second piece of it is, okay, well, how now do we want it to move? Do, you know, it's still not moving, it's just rotating. So the idea is that we need to move in some direction. Now, we wouldn't want the W and S keys to move just up and down. We want them to move the character in relation to where the character is facing, right? To where forward is or up is. So. That's the next challenge to figure out what that is. And thankfully, Unity has some shortcuts for us there. Now, you'll notice I'm rotating the object around, but I can use my transform. Right, This is the transform of my object here. And you'll see I could just get the rotation, but I could also Look for something called up. The green axis of the transform in world space. All right. Now, I'm not going to save my code yet, but look at this. We'll come back over here and we'll hit play. And watch what's happening as I rotate. Um, if I make sure to select that character. Normally, I should see that is not rotating, or that is rotating, but why is my indicator here? Sorry? Uh, I think it's just set to a normal, oh, it's kinematic at this point, right? So I can instantaneously, say it has no physics other than what I explicitly, so it's not interacting with the physics system other than my explicitly set velocity and so on, right? Right. So let's see. Um, let me make sure, let me, let me print out some things here so I can figure out what did I... So let's say in our... show axis, our little debugging bit here. And this is, a, this is a good technique. You should consider this. So let's say print our 
transform up vector, right? The green axis of the transform in world space, right? So we'll come here and we should see zero, one, zero. And you'll now notice it says 0.9, negative 0 0.50. And as I rotate, that transform is changing. So here, let's see, can I find a good way of printing out? Well, we'll just go by this. So we're changing the orientation of this game object by giving it an angular velocity. And that orientation is reflected by its local coordinate space, right? So if I were to get it sort of back in the up, in the normal up position, right, perfect, All right? Now it's zero, one, zero again. So imagine I could then use my V key to say move up or down. So that would be multiplying that up vector, move up and down. So let's go to our code and give that a try. All right, so we'll go in here and we have this part controlling our rotation, but now let's set our rigid body's velocity to speed times get axis vertical, right? But now we don't want a new vector to here. We want this to be a scalar value that we then multiply by transform. Okay, so here's the magic. We're saying, okay, set the velocity in the direction of our up vector according to the speed and our vertical input axis. And get that one out of there. All right, so as clunky as this looks, we're gonna say, all right, up is the direction his head is pointing, the character's head is pointing. So if I were to press W, no, W or S, the character is moving up and down. Then if I rotate and press W, it's going in that direction. And so now I can turn left and right And I could go backwards if I wanted. So it's much more like driving a car, right? I turn left, I turn right, I press the accelerator, I press the, well, <laughs> the decelerator that makes me go backwards. So different, very, very different type of style of uh, control here. You can imagine, you know, if I had a boat that I wanted to move around, this would make perfect sense. Or if I had a spaceship or other object, right? So it's up to you to decide. You can use either one. Um, generally, the rotational one, now you only, you don't need like a left animation and a right animation and an up animation and a down animation because you're taking care of the orientation according to the rotation of this object, All right? That's kind of neat. Whereas in the other style, and now we're gonna get fancy, the other style, the orientation is determined by the actual orientation of the, of the um, player or the character is gonna be determined by the animation. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take my tank style version and I'm going to say, 
okay, let's drop it in here. If I hold down the left shift key, I'm going to use my vehicular motion. If I'm using my, if I don't have the shift key, I'm going to be using my WASD style motion. Now I'm going to do this. Oops, get rid of that little WASD thing there. Now you can imagine you might have a game where you are playing a little RPG game and your character moves around on the screen. And as long as they are walking, they're using the WASD keys like so. All right. And they're going to come on, walk left, right, up, down. But then they hop into a car. And they move this way. And where it gets slightly weird is if you say, OK, now they hop out of the car. Right, their velocity is back, their orientation is still where it is, but I am deciding their motion here based on the WASD keys, which is probably as it should be. So you would have to, you know, that, that release of the shift key should really be resetting the orientation of the character there, right? Kind of probably makes sense. Ooh, I kind of caught it in between. All right, so it's rotation. It never got a chance to get back to zero. So now I've got it just kind of in infinitely rotating. It's... OK. So those are the two main styles of input and how you would implement them, the basic way that you would implement them using the, uh, the input axes. Now, you can certainly get far fancier than that. Like if you were using an asteroid style game, right, and you really wanted to then instead of, or, or any game, you instead of doing this and explicitly setting these values because you wanted to have it more kind of physics based, instead of directly manipulating the velocity, what you should probably be doing is things like saying add force. And add force is going to be certainly trickier, right? Because you're adding force to the, the body at some particular time. And we'll, we'll talk about physics. We're going to get into that a little bit more later. We'll, we'll leave that for the next discussion, right? But we'll you know, leave those as, as those potential parts in here. So basic pieces. All right, any questions on that? Um, I put the animator bit back in, um, and what really should happen, I should say, I should put the animator in to the part where, to only the part where it's not doing the, the character sort of control part, or it's only the character part, character control part right here. Um, so now the animator's back in, let's turn the animator back on over here. All right, we're going to go in our, where are you? Turn on our animator. And I suppose it would have been weird. So now the animator is sort of doing the right thing here. But if we suddenly were spinning, the animator would have a hard time figuring out, as you can see, it'll be kind of really weird to combine the two things there. The best thing is like, okay, if you're going to rotate, don't use the animator. Um, well, well, yes, right? I, I would say this, okay. It should be animated, but the animation shouldn't be handling the motion. Like, you know, this is this is totally valid that I have a um, an idle animation on this, and maybe if it was a fish swimming or a, a you know a spaceship flying, um, you'll see like right now the character is idle, you know, doing a little animation, 
but the animation makes sense, right? I'm not trying to indicate the direction of the motion with the animation, right? So I could have a little animated exhaust here whenever the player is moving. So that animation might very well be, well, if the player is moving at all, play the jet exhaust animation. There's lots and lots of uses for animation other than the left, right, up, down sort of thing, right? Um, explosions, interactions, you're just really kind of breathing life into your characters so they're not just totally idle and doing it. Um, you don't have to use your you know, animation there. You can use your animation for something else, you know, other parts in the game, environmental things, and, and so on. It's just really to be able to use the animation. Um, so lots, of, lots and lots of options on that one. Oops. Excuse me for a second while I drink a little of my grapefruit juice here. Mmm. Lots of electrolytes. That's what plants crave. Um, did anyone get that one? No. It's got Brano. Uh, Bron, Bron, Brondo? Brondo. That's what it was. What plants crave. Anyway, all right, so back to our, let's go back to our slides for a moment. All right, so this covers the basics of things like the input axes, and there's some examples in here. Um, here, using input axes to directly drive both the movement and animator's state. So this is gonna be, this one's kind of similar to um, the basic case here, where in update, we were getting the input axes uh, the raw and assigning it to this value. Now, this is worth mentioning, and we'll talk about this in much, much more detail in another uh, in, in another class because we're going to go into into the kind of guts of the Unity engine and how physics is handled in internal to the engine. But now we're familiar with update. We haven't really seen the fixed update function yet. We haven't really done much with fixed update. Um, fixed update is the physics loop of Unity's engine, right? The update is the graphics loop and the input loop. The fixed update is the physics loop that happens at a set interval compared to the kind of random rate that, that the graphics loop runs at. So normally when we're manipulating things such as position or adding forces or doing things that, that potentially might affect the physics engine, we do them in fixed update. And this is demonstrating sort of decoupling the two things here where we're getting the input here in update and we're assigning it to these axes, this little kind of temporary value in the, in the class here, and then using it later inside of fixed update. Now that's because for example, in here, instead of just setting the velocity, we might be doing something like move position instead of you know directly manipulating velocity. Since we're just setting the velocity right now, whether we set it set the velocity ten times a second or a hundred times a second, it's still just setting the velocity, right? So it doesn't really show up as a weird thing. Whereas if we were moving specifically moving the body or moving the character by a certain amount, we would probably want to do that in fixed update so that it would happen consistently, right? It's a way to kind of avoid the whole problem that we saw with time, get time, you know, and so on, delta time, right? So that's in here for an example as well. Um, and here, what's the, let's see, option one, using input access to directly drive both the movement and animator state. Ah, and then the other one, this is kind of a fun possibility as well. Whereas you saw like in our version even, if we want to make the, see how here we said, um, oh no, we did it the good way here. This is the good way. Where in our game we said, okay, 
set the animator's X velocity state or X velocity parameter according to the actual velocity of the rigid body, right? Sometimes you want to set an animation or trigger an animation as a direct result of the user's input, right? You press a key or something like that. You want to directly do it. But the cool thing about this is that we've effectively, you know, you've sort of decoupled or kind of cut loose this decision from the actual user input. And it's really changing that velocity, changing that, that value according to the physics of the rigid body, right? So it's better to have it, you know, having animations kind of tied to that, because then we can do this anywhere in our code and it would still do the right thing because it's just looking at the velocity which the engine is taking care of. So I'm going to post this these slides here. I'm going to catch up on a bunch of slides to be posted. So in case you're looking at the slides and why there's two versions, the first version you'll see here, for example, it set the animator component, the parameters according to the actual input, the joystick, whereas the second version set the animator's component parameters according to the velocity of the rigid body, which is the fancier, slicker way to do it. Because right. it's only going to change it according to the actual physics of it. All right. So in these slides, I also had a bonus here. So some people, if you are interested in doing a game such as Asteroids, um, or you've got something where you're just kind of flying around the, the screen like we are currently dealing with, you might want to wrap the character's motion or an object's motion according to the screen so that you, instead of you know, flying off the edge or bumping into the edge, you might you know, shoot off one edge of the screen and show up on the other end, edge of the screen. So how do you do that? Well, it's kind of a fun one. And we'll throw this in there. So if you go off, if you exceed some value, we're just gonna have some hard-coded values you know, eight and a half meters. If you go eight and a half meters in the X direction or five meters in the Y direction, what it's going to do is just change your position by inverting that particular component, right? So if you wind up at eight over on here or at nine, I should say, it will put you back at negative nine on the opposite side, right? So as you seed one, you wind up on the other. It's kind of a fun technique. So a lot of people like to do that in their game. And this is how you would do it. So let's go into our code here. And so in update, we might have just a simple thing in here where we're going to get, OK, get the position of the game object we're currently on, and then check. Is it greater than some maximum of amount? And if so, you know, flip the position. And same goes for the y, and then set the transform position of that object to that new value. Right, so that a whirl. So now we should have a, a real kind of asteroids feel to our character here, hopefully. So we'll press shift. And we kind of fly off the top of the screen. And we reappear on the bottom of the screen. And we'll fly off this edge of the screen up here on the other side. And with the debugging and streaming and everything going on slightly, well, that was interesting. Might be, it's a little bit quirky here. Oh, I think we got a weird edge, edge condition here where we haven't quite moved enough. Remember our X moving left and right on the, uh, um, or our, our apple tree moving left and right, we had to make sure it remained on the screen. So we sort of have that same situation here where we might want to say, you know, clamp this value to make sure it's not off the edge there and flipping back and forth. I'm not sure that's really happening or not. But So edge conditions are always a little bit funky that you want to be careful of. Yeah, that 
should be actually that's okay here. I think our glitching there might have been just because we have a lot of stuff all playing on the computer at the same time. But be aware of that one. Okay, so that's a fun. Just that's just a an extra bonus thing here. Um, there. Okay, extra bonus. Yeah, this slide. These slides. We'll be there, and there's some there's some bonus activities. Actually, I should have put I should put these two bonus ones. In. I'll put, put these as the last. I'm gonna move these around. We're we're editing it live here. Um, we'll move these to the sort of bottom of the presentation here. What do we got there? All right. So another topic mentioned in the uh, early on here, we had this notion of serialize field. Okay. So now, one of the things you've you've dealt with, you've done um, you've done player prefs, and you set values to be global when you wanted to change them in the Unity editor, and that's not an entirely great practice to set things arbitrarily to global because that sort of violates you know a bit of object oriented design to just you know just say oh just make it global, make it global, make it public, you know make it oh, yeah sorry I didn't mean to say global I meant to say public. So in here, for example, in, in, our, in our main script here, our mega move script, we've set speed to be public and rotation speed to be public. And that means if anybody wanted to change our speed, the speed of this component, they could actually do a game object dot find, get the, the, the name of that object, and then call the, or, or you know, directly manipulate these things directly um, through code, through another script. And in the case of object-oriented design, that's not something you generally want to do. You want to have you know, strictly defined interfaces between objects. Right? You want to say, OK, if you want to change the speed of something, you should call the set speed function or you know, explicitly go through an, an API, an interface to that. We'll talk uh, about even more ways to kind of make this explicit. But generally, declaring lots of stuff public is frowned upon. But we've got this issue where, well, we, how else could we expose it to the Unity editor so that the Unity editor will allow us to change values there and to also serialize it or save it with our project, you know, change those values and save those values. So fortunately for us, we don't have to necessarily declare these things to be public. And instead, we've got some sort of special decorations that Unity will allow us to put on is, as part of the pre-processing of our code. And one of them is serialized field. Okay. Um, so serialized field is really just do it, it's gonna do this on, on the next particular, the next uh, variable it finds. And so you'll see force Unity to serialize a private field. So what serialization means is expose it to the Unity editor and save it as part of the Unity project. So now, this to the editor over here, you'll see we still have speed and rotation speed exposed to our editor, but they are private to this script. So other scripts can't just come along and clobber it and do you know crazy things. It's gonna it's gonna make sure to not um, allow others to just kind of modify those parameters without going the right route. Right. So we want to use this serialized script in favor of uh, instead of you just declaring things public. You should always really have a reason to declare something public. And up until now, we accepted it as a reason because you want it to be exposed to the Unity editor. But it's not really, really great practice. Instead, let's talk about this, you know, this serialized field that you can use. All right. So. OK. Um, what serialized field does, serialized field is private, right? So it's the same thing. The moment I took this off is now. This, these are now private fields within this class, right? So I could not, like, for instance, if I was in SnowKid here, say I had SnowKid, and 
I might have a script on Snow Kid, which I don't have. Uh, we'll call this Snow Script. And if I wanted in Snow Script, say I wanted to change, for some reason, I wanted to change the value of the speed of Mega Man here. I could go in here and say game object uh, find Mega Man get components um, and let's see, let me make sure I'm referencing the right component here. So on Mega Man, we have Mega Move. Mega Move dot, so now, we're, now we've gotten this component. So this gives us a, 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 a reference to that component. And we could say dot speed. You notice I can't say dot speed, right? It won't let it won't fill that for me. It won't let me change that, right? Because this is a private variable. It's a private field in here, right? If I change this and said, well, okay, this is public here, then you see it lets me change it. It says, ah, there is a field in there that's called megamove.speed and allow me to change that. All right, so some of the features of language, the object-oriented languages, uh, object-oriented features of the language are really to enforce data encapsulation, to enforce you know, decoupling of structures and so on, to make sure that you are kind of considering how interfaces are exposed or how different things are exposed. Because you know, if someone comes along and designs one piece of code to interact on some kind of very low level with another piece of code, it, it kind of permanently couples the structure of those two together, right? So it's, it's better to have a, a very clean, well-defined interface in between your functions, right? You'd, you'd only use serialize if you wanted to be able to edit it from the from the unity editor. That's that's kind of the, the bonus part there, right? So if you want it to be serialized by the unity editor, that's when you would make it serialized field. And you'll notice by default, if you declare a variable, like if I come in here and mega move and I just say, you know, float foo. By default, that is a private field within my yeah, private member inside of this class, as it should be. That's, that's the normal case. That's what good object-oriented practices want you to do. You know, if you have some variable, if you have some memory that you're going to use, you know, some field that you're going to use that you manipulate, it should be private to the class. If you want to make it accessible to the rest of your code, do it in a very structured way, right? Through some sort of interface or API, you know, it should be through something like I, you know, the, the most explicit thing I could do is say, ah, okay, I'll have a public void set speed. And that's gonna take a float new speed. And because I might very well in here say something like, ah, okay, I know what the maximum speed of this should be, right? As the programmer, it should never exceed. So I should say, ah, okay, if new speed is less than five, then, okay, speed equals new speed, right? That's, that's why we do these things, because I know as the designer of this class, Oh, someone typed. Is it better to find all the attached objects prefabs than use a field as public? Um, it's you've sort of combined two different issues there. Okay. 
um, finding is the way to, uh, you know, in general, if you want to find the attached components of an object, um, you wouldn't necessarily want to do find all the time because find can be very inefficient, right? It's just a way to conveniently do it. Um, but then having public fields is another issue on top of that one, all right? So if you needed to, like in a lot of cases, we're, we're looking for game objects and we're having them communicate back and forth one another. Uh, other. So let's go back to our snow script over here. You know, imagine we have this case where you want to interact with Mega Man for some reason. And, and we do this a lot. We say, okay, public wanted to reference something about Mega Man, right? Um, so we've done this a lot. And then we would say, ah, okay, Mega Man ref, I'd get component. So what do you use game object dot find or you use this sort of structure, right? Um, the nice thing about using find, and I probably would want to do it up in start here, is that it, it then doesn't, I don't have to explicitly set it in the editor. I can, you know, just go ahead and do that. The bad part of that is if I use find, then I'm hard coding the name of that object in here. So that's kind of bad because, you know, later on you might want to change which object that refers to so you can just like set it up in here. So you've got choices to make. You know, what is the best way to do it? It depends, right? I would, in, in, in some circumstances, you want to do it dynamically. If it's something that's going on in a prefab, for example, that's not really in the scene to begin with and you can't really assign it in the editor, then you do want to do it using find. So it's tricky. You'll start to see as you start to design, sometimes you'll want to do it one way, sometimes you'll want to do it another way. Generally, when you have something that happens over and over again, like if you had something in update, you wouldn't want to use gameobject.find in update because it's using a string to kind of parse through the whole world and figure out the reference to that object. Um, but now, yeah, this is sort of a, a separate issue. So instead of speed, I would call set speed and give it, you know, I could give it, oh, I could try to set the speed to a thousand. And it would, you know, I don't know what the maximum speed of Mega Man should be because I didn't design the Mega Man, right? So, so that's, I could try this. And then the person that has written this code says, well, okay, if new speed less than five... Uh, speed equals new speed um, else, you know, you could say, or you could say, well, speed equals um, math f dot clamp new speed and make it negative five f f. So if as designer, I was to say, okay, Mega Man, this character, whatever this, this character that this script is attached to has a maximum speed of negative five in one direction or positive five in the other direction. For some reason, I want to enforce that, right? Now, by forcing other programmers to, to communicate with it through this API, through this interface, I have that level of control, right? Because I may very well do other things in there as well, not just you know enforce certain limitations on the speed. Maybe it means, oh, okay, if you try to set the speed higher than that, it's going to give you the bigger version of the character. You know, something odd like that, or you know, something well thought out. We'll call it not odd, right? So that's one of the keys of good object-oriented design, right? That you own you you only exposed what is necessary for other pieces of your code to manipulate. And when you do expose those pieces of code, you do it through a well-established, maintainable API. All right. So whew, that was a bit of a tangent that I hadn't expected, but it's a good one. I mean, it is sort of a fundamental... Mm. 
fundamental one for, for um, you know, good or object oriented design. You're getting your money's worth today. It's, I think, I hope. All right. So we've established this nice clean interface here to set the maximum, set the speed of the, our mega mover object. We're going to try to set it here. But now the nice thing is in our code, right? Snow Kid, innocently, we think Snow Kid's going to try to set the speed of Mega Man to a, you know, you see Mega Man's speed right now is negative, is three. And watch what happens. It should get set to. Wow, oh, where'd Snow Kid go? Hey, Snow Kid. Oh, let's see. Unsigned ref. Oh, I know what that was. Sorry. We, we do have a bug. We created the obvious bug where the Snow Kid had no reference to the Mega Man reference here. Okay. And that, so that was like, all right. So let's do this. Let's fix it first. Now we want Snow Kid to try to manipulate the speed of this specific Mega Man. So Snow Kid's going to try to set it to a thousand, but it's only able to set it to five because it's maxing it out there, okay? Whew. If that is anybody's head spinning, I apologize, but it's a good one. Um, think about that. Consider that. Uh, so we're at 346. Ooh. All right, we're just going to plow through some things. Now, Back to our slides, see if we can get there. So this is serialized field. And the notion is, you know, again, it's really there so that you can expose a field to the editor without making it public. So it's editor, it's editable from the editor and it is saved when the project or scene is saved. Normally a public is also saved if it's saved when the scene, uh, project and scene is, but it's better to use serialized field so that you're not getting bad habits of you know, declaring lots of things public unnecessarily. All right. So say you want to serialize something that is more complex. You want to start creating data that is more intricate, that has more to it. You know, maybe you have a card game where, you know, there's like, uh, there's, some infant, you know, kind of a deck builder kind of game, and you have, you know, 52 different types of cards. And so you have, you're going to have some sort of data structure for each card. And maybe designers are going to, you know, be designing those and so on. So you don't necessarily want to be defining all of those things in code in, you know, kind of the behavior of those, of those cards. But you want to give, you know, have some way of kind of organizing that structure and kind of creating a little bit more organization of your code at, at a bit of a higher level and maintainable level. And Unity has these things called scriptable objects that you can use for that. All right. So scriptable objects are the basis for serializable classes, right? To have whole classes of, of uh, functionality or classes of uh, variables that can be serialized. And you can hold, you can use them to hold multiple variations of data like prefabs, but unlike prefabs, they actually exist. A, a prefab is sort of a template for a structure. A scriptable object becomes an actual object that contains data within your project. So when you declare a scriptable object, you, you have to base it on the structure called scriptable object instead of a, um, instead of a mono behavior. And that's because scriptable objects only contain data. Okay. They can refer to data that uh, in classes that, that Unity knows about, things like prefabs and game objects and so on, but it doesn't have all the functionality of a real mono behavior, right? So you can think of scriptable objects as sort of like something that, that becomes a, a bucket of data that you can refer to. Now this extra bit here, this create asset menu file equals data, this extra decoration, you see it in these square brackets. It's sort of like, you know, it's that extra decoration like we had for serialized fields, but this, including this in your code, 
Here's a secret. There are ways to actually modify the Unity editor through the code that is contained in the project. So for example, this, I'm creating a new entry in the asset menu called data. It's going to be within scriptable objects game data, and this is the order that it appears in. So let's, let me show you an, a, a game that, that actually uses this that I created. Let's see. Yeah, look at that. Uh, so let's go over here. So this is my, I thought it was, where'd it go? Okay, there it is. This is my Enter the Coinsion game here, my kind of crazy, it's a 2019 game. And there's a couple of different areas that I use these scriptable objects in. So let me press play. And one of the things you'll notice in the game is that if it ever starts playing is, come on, Unity. OK. As I start moving, you see up here, it says, welcome to my adventure. And if I come to this sign, it says, Welcome to, whoops, all right, I've got people talking to me. I've got too much stuff going on. Let's get that person out of there. I come over here, it says, welcome to Little Town. I walk away, and then that goes away. And then I go down here, and there's another sign. Oh, wait, there's a well. It says, uh, whoops, too much going on. You reach the center of town. Uh, all right, let's go this way. And there's another sign over here. I touch that sign. It says, you come to an inn. So there's bits of data throughout here. And even if I bump into a squirrel, I think. Well, let's see if I bumped into this treasure chest, maybe. Congrats. You can multi-flip four plus one coins now. So I can do this kind of multi thing. All right. So there's this a lot of data behind the scenes in this kind of dialogue system that I've implemented. So there's no big list somewhere. Like you might think for this dialogue system, there's some big list in some code somewhere that says, oh, okay, here's all the different responses. Because there's different responses depending on if you, you know, this, this particular um, signpost here versus this squirrel over here versus, you know, everything can have its own little script. Um, and sometimes some of those even, you know, kind of use other ones. And as the programmer, I might want to give my narrative designer the ability to provide those bits of script, for example. Um, or as my game designer, you know, like in the card, the card deck building game, you know, I might want to give the designer the ability to add more cards to the game and that, that sort of thing. So that's why scriptable objects are sort of interesting in that regard. So let's go over here and you'll see now because of that extra little bonus piece that I had, um, I'm actually in my... I have a directory here full, and it's in my scripts directory called signs and conversations. And these little objects in here, these assets are my scriptable objects that have been instanced. And here, if we look, you can see over here, this conversation is a scriptable object that has a string in it and whether or not it auto advances in it. So I have a little bit of a description here. So there's my, there's a conversation. And then I also have another one called NPC list, which is going to have a bunch of game objects in that I could potentially iterate over and spawn. So let's see. So squirrel talk is one conversation. And if I bump into a squirrel, it just it says, hello, I'm a squirrel. Uh, if I reach the end of town sign, okay, here's one. It's got two lines and it said you reach the end of the main road you are leaving little town here's another conversation hello i'm bob welcome to town what you know i could have these sort of things in there here's a sign for the inn you come to an inn loud music emanates as you in so on so on okay so if i were to right click here and said create you'll see that there are conversations and npc lists so i could create a new conversation here and I'll call this get out conversation. And if I click on there, and I'm going to set this to be one, and I'm going to just say get out of here. 
So this is a potential conversation then that I could use somewhere um, in my game. And maybe I'll put it on this sign here. All right. So now this sign has a conversation on it called my convo. You can see here's the town center one. And so if instead now I'm going to put the get out conversation on it, so put that there. And if I hit play in my game, and once the game starts playing, I'm down here and get out of here, you know, happens. So if you're considering, you know, scriptable or serializable data that you're trying to, you know, kind of create different data structures that you can save with your game that define certain aspects of your game, this is a little bit more advanced. You may or may not want to use this, but, you know, I've been asked about like the dialogue system and some of the other things. Um, if you wanted to say, have a list of potential, um, uh, spawn points or a list of uh, power-ups, things like that. You can do that through these sort of structures here, right? By using these um, scriptable objects. So let's jump back to the slides. All right. So yeah, the object, the scriptable objects are the base basis for serializable classes for basically containing, you know, kind of having these data structures these classes that you can use as just kind of a bucket to hold a bunch of information and then allow for interaction between that and the and scripts and other classes and things without necessarily digging into the code, right? You'll notice now I can add additional ones and I didn't have to write any code. I could just, you know, entirely add a new conversation here, change my story without going into the code, right? A lot of these tools are specifically so that multiple people can work on things at the same time without clobbering one another, right? These projects are bigger. These, you know, that's features of language uh, you know, so that, that you can collaboratively work on code or define different um, sections that, that make sense. So, all right. And oh, do I really want to, it is 3.57. Let's see. This has been a lot of stuff, and I don't think I want to get into delegates at this point because it's it's already sort of enough to digest. Um, and I actually have an entirely other presentation. We can talk about subscribers and um, subscriber publisher events and delegates. So we're going to maybe draw the line today on there, uh, input axes is the most important thing. What I'd like to see you start doing is again, thinking about um, your game design for the next game. This is where it's you know getting real important. And I forgot what I mentioned with regards to starting to do, um, to provide a bit of design to your next game, um, but we should be, Yes, a very basic couple of paragraphs to a page or two kind of saying, okay, my idea for my shoot 'em up is I want to do something in a RPG style or an asteroid style or a enter the gungeon style or, a, you know, thinking about this sort of top down approach. The sort of things that, you know, is there, you know, the main character excuse me, the main character is a blank. It interacts with blank and blank. The enemy blanks can blank at the player. You know, these, these sort of things, you know, it doesn't have to be super uh, uh, tight with regards. And you certainly can't, things can change. Um, but, you know, thinking about a basic design and certain things that you'd like, you know, you're, you could have some stretch goals if you wanted to actually have a, Dialogue system, you know, that could be a stretch goal. Um, you know, what are you thinking with regards to power ups? How do you think, you know, do you want to try to do a, you'll notice here this, this player here, these little kind of uh, candy cane beach ball things 
indicate the aiming of the uh, of the character. And so this is actually a sort of a twin stick design where the player has an orientation that it's moving in, but then it fires, it can even fire behind itself. Kind of blowing up the house here. So you basically have some ideas on, okay, what are the techniques you need to either ask about or review or do a bit of research on um, so that you know how are you going to get to your goal, right? So this week you should be thinking about, okay, I want to design a shoot 'em up and here are the interesting features that you're interested in. You know, I think, yeah, I thought I said last week, you know, the, the assignment over the weekend was to play a bunch of games as research and be prepared this week to talk about um, what you might want to implement in your game. Like, you know, it's here. Oh, okay. I can grab a, here's the power up here, a multi-flip. So now I've got my four plus one and it's got a cool down where if I fire too many, it, it then cools down. Oh, there's a gold chest. Congrats. You can multi-flip four plus one. Okay. Oh, that's the mega flip. That should have had the mega flip uh, conversation on there. So <clears throat> once again, the um, requirements, let me pull the requirements over here. The qu requirements are pretty, you know, despite there being a bunch of them, they are pretty open. You know, Im implement a basic player, player controller. Now we know, now we know the, the character-based control or a vehicle-based control you know, using rigid body and input access to control the motion. Okay, you still have some decisions to make. Which of these do you want? You know, is the player, you know, basically do you want to start as a player controller and work from there? What sort of projectile attack? Um, and so on. What should this, how should the screen be laid out? You know, are you going to have, uh, what type of behavior would you, do you think that you want the enemies to have? We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of AI and stuff uh, with regards to that as well, All right? So let's leave the next 20 minutes or so for today uh, to not be streamed, but leave it open to questions, you know, kind of brainstorming if you want to do it directly in, in the main discussion group or you want to send me direct messages, um, just to sort of brainstorming. On you on where you'd want to go with the shmup, and I'll say, okay, does this fit in? Does it not fit in? You know, and so on. Um, you don't have to necessarily, you know, throw out to, if you just want to, you know, again, sit in front of a, a raw notepad, open a blank notepad file, and start just typing in some ideas. Um, by all means, do that. Uh, if you want to, you know, search for some assets in the asset store that, you know will inspire you to create a certain type of character. By all means, do that. But that's what we'll do for the next 20 minutes. Sound good? I think it sounds pretty good. OK. Yes. OK. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you want to have something where you could either have specific buttons that do it, or it could be based on a range. You know, if the character ha is within a certain range, then it automatically knows to throw something. If you are, you know, if you're within some sort of coll collision range or, you know, checking the distance, it could be a melee attack. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of different, different decisions and approaches to that. Like I said, there's the automatic version, or you could have, you know, separate buttons or keys to say, do one or the other. Uh, it might be a power up sort of thing that you might then cycle through different attacks. Um, yeah, that'd be uh, very interesting. All right. All right. Very good. Okay, I'm going to end the stream and I'm here for questions and answers. And I've got a bunch of questions piling up from the Game Dev One students as well, whose big one of their big projects is due tomorrow. So. <laughs> We'll see how that goes. All right. <clears throat>